morning, everyone. I hope you are well. To those that are here present and to those that are joining us online, we welcome you. We welcome you. You know, it might be tempting to think that the church is reopening. Karma is starting the process of reopening, so long as the CDC guidelines lets us. Other churches are also starting that process. The reality is the church never closed. We've always been open. The only difference is, thankfully, God be to the praise to God that the building can be open so we can come together and worship physically together. Because every weekend we've been coming together to worship together. And even those are online right now are still worshiping together with us. So it's a beautiful thing when the children of God come together and worship the Lord. Today is Sermon 5 in our Pentecost series, Encountering the Holy Spirit. And thus far we've looked more at who the Spirit is than really how the Holy Spirit interacts, encounters, operates within the Church of God. And usually we think of these situations, we think of how God moves within the church in these mysterious and miraculous ways, these huge big events. And we, rightly so, we read them in the Bible. In fact, this whole sermon series started off a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 2 when the church was born, we're told that there was a loud blow, a loud sound of wind that came, a rush of wind, symbolizing the Holy Spirit coming upon the people. And that the Holy Spirit filled everybody. And that it was so loud, people came to see what was happening. And there was tons of fire on the head. And even to this day, scholars debate on exactly what those tongues of fire really are. Were they literal? Were they not literal? Et cetera, et cetera. So there are stories in the Bible where the Holy Spirit acts in these really powerful, mysterious, miraculous ways. God is a God of mystery. God is a God of power. God is a God of miracle. However, at the same time, God is a God of practicality. And what we discover in the Bible, and also through experience, is that the primary way in which God works, the primary way in which the Holy Spirit works within the church, is a practicality. We call that spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are given to us so that the church functions correctly. And if you look at all the gifts that are listed in the Bible, they're quite practical. Our scripture comes from Romans chapter 12. Verses 3 to 8. Paul is writing. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. Passionate and cheerfulness. The word of God for people of God. Praise be to God. One of the first things you will notice in this passage is the tone that Paul sets for this whole section. We know that he eventually gets to spiritual gifts, but before he even begins to discuss spiritual gifts, he sets a very, very important tone. A tone that is imperative to understand. Paul states that everyone among us ought not to think higher than they ought to. 
And he uses a phrase, he uses a word in Greek that means sober judgment, or at least that's how the NRSV translates it. In fact, if you look in different Bibles and different translations, they'll translate that word differently. And out of all the research I've done, I think the most the best translation for this particular verse, for this particular passage, is actually to be rational without illusion. To be rational without illusion. To be rational without illusion is what we describe in modern day as simply being a sound mind. A sound mind. And the broad definition associated with being of sound mind is someone who has the mental capacity to understand what is going on around them and to make important decisions involving themselves, involving the family, involving the society, involving the people around their life. Essentially, it's being able to look around you and accurately and honestly be able to assess who you are as a person, assess your talents and your gifts and everything else, and also being able to assess the same thing of those around you. It's to be rational without illusion. And Paul says, be rational without illusion. Honestly assess who you are, and honestly assess the people around you. Be humble. Be humble. And they have done multiple studies to show that humans probably need to listen and be reminded of this multiple times. Multiple times. They've done studies to show that each one of us has a type of tendency to think that we're a little better than what we actually are. And the people around them to think just a little lesser. I remember one study they gave, they told someone to run a mile. They didn't tell them how long it took. And what's interesting is after they finished the mile, the statistics show that the majority of the people thought they finished the mile in less time than what was actually given. And when they said, how long did your associates take, they actually gave them more time to finish. So somewhere in their mind, they thought they finished earlier than what they really did, and all their friends and associates finished later than what they really did. We have a tendency to think that way. The opposite is also true. Some people think too negatively of themselves and think too highly of other people. And Paul says, scratch all that. Throw all that away. Don't think too negatively of yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself. Don't do the same thing with other people. Just honestly assess who you are and the people around you. And that is so key before he even begins to talk about spiritual gifts. It's so key because he knows that spiritual gifts, by its nature, humans can then begin to create this hierarchy of who has the better gifts, who's more powerful, who's on top, and who's on bottom. He dealt with that during the time because during the time, people thought that prophets were higher than other people. And throughout church history, we see this happening as well, where certain roles of certain gifts are given more superiority. But the truth of the matter is there's not a hierarchy. There's not a hierarchy. Spiritual gifts don't work that way. In fact, Paul brings that point out later on when he begins to talk about the body. In the first Corinthians chapter 12, he actually discusses this in a little more detail. I'm not going to read all of it. I welcome you to go ahead and read the majority of it. I'm going to start at verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. In fullness, we were made to drink of the one spirit. Whatever your gifts are, whatever they are, you've been made to drink the entirety and fullness of the spirit. This is somebody else. 
Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head and feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. a lot to unpack there. Paul's making an analogy. The body of Christ is like your body. And every part of your body is needed for your body to function correctly. Every part of your body is needed for it to function fully. Go home when you get a chance, or if you're already home, you can try this activity. Put some chairs around so you don't fall over. And for like one hour, blindfold yourself. Down and try to do all the activities you usually do, usually routine. Try to make your coffee, try to turn on your TV, try to get your, your cell phone out and call your dad if today's father is today's father. Try to call your dad and wish, wish him a happy Father's Day. Do your normal routines, so to speak. And you will find that because we use sight, since we've used sight since we've been born, the majority of us, we've become accustomed to using it. And so if we blindfold ourselves, it will be extremely difficult, extremely difficult to do just normal routines, like make coffee or something like that. Every part of our body is needed for it to function as it was designed to function. The same is true for the body of Christ. I can't tell my eye I have no need of it. I can't tell my ears I have no need of it. At the same time, I can't go to someone and say, oh, you have this gift. Oh, you have the gift of hospitality. I, I don't, I, there's no need for you. No. Oh, you have uh, this gift. Oh, there's no need for you. That's, that's not true. We all are in need of each other. Our gifts, our roles are in need of each other. This is why Paul states at the very end that what we consider weaker are actually indispensable. And we do that. We have a hierarchy. We had a hierarchy for a while now where we say, let's see, prophets, teachers, apostles, um, you know, people who speak in tongues, they're the, they're the ones at the top of the hierarchy of spiritual gifts and roles. But, you know, people who have a gift of like charity, hospitality, service, they're on the bottom end. And, and we need the prophets more. We don't need the servants more. We need the teachers more. We don't need these people down here as much. And Paul says that's completely untrue. What you think are actually weaker members on the bottom of the hierarchy are indispensable. You need them just as much, equally, 100%, just as much as what you might consider the ones on top. And Paul puts that down. Sometimes I think of it as having no stairs. I'm getting older. And I'm growing more no stairs. And I don't necessarily like them. Who does? Put a part of my body. You know. I I like other parts of my body better. But what do my no stairs do actually? Well, they protect me from allergens and dust and all sorts of other stuff that I breathe in. My nose hairs protect me from getting junk in my lungs. So there's your tip for today, for everyone at home and everyone here. If you want the best medicine, the best strategy, the best strategy to deal with allergies or allergies, just don't pluck your nose hairs. And then when your wife says, you should pluck your nose hairs, you can tell her, I'm being careful and safe. Everyone in the church is needed equally. Paul put 
puts that down, makes that tone before he even begins to discuss spiritual gifts. And it is only after establishing such an important tone does he begin to talk about it. Now, in Romans, he mentions a few. In 1 Corinthians 12, he mentions more. In many other places in the Bible, there's a lot more spiritual gifts. And what you have before you is a piece of paper adopted. For those of you online, we have a PDF file that you can download and print for yourself. If you want more of these, there's more right here. It's a spiritual gifts inventory. It's helpful because it is a compilation of the many gifts listed in the Bible. It provides an assessment to discover your spiritual gifts. Now, these gifts are not exhaustive. They're a guide. There's a lot, but it's not exhaustive. It doesn't fully encompass the totality of all the gifts listed in the Bible. Neither is it absolute. It's simply a guide to help you discover what your gifts are. And I say discover because it's not a one-time event either. I've taken this assessment many, many, many times, and I have discovered my gifts through those times because what I've noticed is that it is the gifts that become consistent through my life that are truly the ones that God has given me. And you can't necessarily find that out by just taking it once. So take it once a year. Take it once every couple of years. And you'll notice after three, four, five different times taking it, you'll notice, wow, this gift shows up time and time and time again. The consistency lets you know what gifts God is anointing you with. And maybe you have done this before, and that's fine. But we can continue to do it continue to grow, continue to learn our gifts and our gifts set. Another important point is that these are not, and I mentioned this before, these are not absolute. God can take them away. God can also empower us more with gifts as we grow older. We don't own the gifts. God owns the gifts. And that's why it's important to we take this. And that's why it's also important to stay humble, as I mentioned in the first part of this scripture. Pay attention also to your brothers and sisters in Christ, in the church. Oftentimes, God speaks, in fact, not just oftentimes, all the time, God will speak through his people. You might discover your gifts by listening to your brothers and sisters. Maybe you sing really well, and over the course of two or three weeks, you have someone coming up to you and saying, wow, you sing really well. God's really giving you a gift, or maybe teaching, or some other gift that you hear over and over again. That clues you in. God is speaking to you. That might be a gift you have. And lastly, don't get locked into the belief that you can only function according to the role or gift that God has given you. Your gifts, yes, are given for the functionality of the church. To function fully to the wholeness that God wants. However, they do not exclude you from service. I have the gift of teaching, for example. I don't. I do not have the gift of charity. I've taken this assessment many times. I have not been given the gift of charity. But that doesn't mean I can go. Well, I don't have the gift of charity. That means I guess I'm going to be tied and I don't need now to help out the poor. That's not my gift. That's not my gift. Sorry, I'm, I got to go to the store and buy what I want. I can't. I can't do that. It may not be my gift, but I'm still called to serve and give to. The so yes, you might have a gift set, but that doesn't exclude you from the broader service. If God puts that on your heart, if God calls you to do that, then be sure to do it. The reality is the gifts are not yours. The gifts are not mine. The gifts are not ours. It's God. And the gifts are not to put us on a pedestal to say, pay attention to me, look how awesome it is. It's so that we can come together and work together and we can edify each other and encourage one another and build us up as the people of God. That's what the gifts are for. Oftentimes, we lose track of that. <coughs> Maybe you can't even come up, I'm going to throw them off. My friends, we have all been given spiritual gifts, and it's for a reason. The source is the Holy Spirit. 
This Pentecost series of encountering the Holy Spirit is focused on the Holy Spirit all throughout it, and that is not changed. This is true for today's sermon. For the gifts we have are not our own. We may possess them, but the Holy Spirit claims ownership to them. And it is the Holy Spirit moving in, through, and amongst us as we use them. When we teach, it is the Holy Spirit instructing us. When we heal, it is by the hand of the Spirit doing that. When we are hospitable, we experience the joy and fellowship and love of the Holy Spirit. And the beauty of all of this is that we get to experience the joy and fellowship of the Holy Spirit as we're engaging with the gifts. Because that's what the gifts do. It's God doing the work. We're not really doing the work. We're, God is using us in, in some sense. Yes, we're using the gifts, but it's God really doing the work. And he's saying, join me. I'm giving you this gift. So as you journey, as you do this, you can experience fellowship with me. And not only fellowship with me, but fellowship with your church, fellowship with your brothers and sisters, because my gifts are not for me. My gifts are for you. I don't come up here preaching every week for myself. It's for you. You don't use your gifts for yourself. You use them for your brothers and sisters to build up the church as a whole. So what now? Friends, we need you. We all need you. All of you in your own way have invested time and energy for this congregation. And I want you to ask yourself, how can God use your gifts to continue to encourage and edify this congregation? And only God can answer that question. Perhaps it is through teaching a Bible study. Perhaps it is through serving in some way a greeter here at the tech sound booth. Maybe it's here on the music team. Maybe God's given you that beautiful voice. And you have the gift of singing. Take all these spiritual assessments. Take time to discover your gifts and ask yourself, how can God use your gifts for part of Christian fellowship church? How can God use your gifts for the broader church in general? Because we're part of the broader church. We're a congregation part of the church. Now, obviously, considering the dynamics of COVID-19 and the phase of reopening, we have to be flexible. So perhaps a better question as you do this assessment at home, perhaps a better question is, how can God use your particular gifts for the edification of the church within the context of our ever-changing lives in this new scenario in relation to this COVID-19? Dear Spirit of God, you have anointed each one of us with spiritual gifts. This gift set is not our own. You are the source. You own them. As we go forth this day, please grant us discernment so that we might be able to understand our gift set. Empower us to use them as you see fit to edify and encourage your church. Give us passion and lead us to a deeper understanding of how you want us to be used here at Karma Christian Fellowship Church and the broader church beyond us. Give us insight in how to do this in the context of COVID-19 and everything else happening in 2020. Lastly, Holy Spirit, we thank you for as we use these gifts, we grow in fellowship with you and fellowship with each other. You ultimately, God, bring us joy, even in the most practical of ways. So we praise you this day. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit.